I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello, and welcome to a very special Labor Day edition of The Watch. It's a great podcast brought to you by the Ringer Podcast Network, where you can find all your Ringer pals. I uh, hope you're enjoying the long weekend. I know I am. I mean, I hope I am. I'm not actually saying this on Labor Day. I'm saying this in advance. Chris is enjoying it somewhere. I hope Zach Mack is on an island somewhere, not thinking about Game of Thrones. But today's very special episode is my conversation with one of my favorite people in show business, Aya Cash. Aya is the star of the FXX comedy, You're the Worst, which returns for its fourth season this week, Wednesday, September 6th. And Aya's been a guest on the podcast before. In fact, I think she was the last guest that I ever interviewed back in the old Grantland days, but I don't blame her for it one bit. Um, And we've been friendly since then. So it was great to have her in kind of a rambling talk because we were having a good time. But I really felt like we had some interesting things to say about the state of Hollywood, what it's like to be a working actor, what it's like to be a working actor in New York versus L.A. She told me about a really interesting movie project she's putting together uh, and hoping to direct and star in based on a book by her mother. And yes, she does spell her mother's last name, so you can check out the book. Aya is a delight. You're the worst fourth season. I've only seen the season premiere, an extra long double-sized season premiere. It's really good. Uh, It is really funny. The show remains one of the most... Uh, savage, hilarious, and low-key emotional series on television. It's always pushing forward. It's always exciting to watch. I really recommend it. Um, But I will say again, even if you haven't seen You're the Worst, and come on, get it together. It's streaming on Hulu. You can watch You're the Worst. But even if you haven't, I hope you find something to enjoy in this conversation with Aya Cash. She is really delightful and really honest about her profession. So give it a listen. Have a great holiday weekend. We'll be back with a brand new show on Thursday. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I hope you're not disappointed that Chris isn't here. Like, I hope it's not like a Terry mm, Gross situation. No. Why Why would I feel that way? More attention on me. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's I'm true. an actor. You're, you realize that. We are here to feed. <laughs> not you, because we have no food. The, the ego that can never be sated. Never. But we will do our best to shovel coal Great. into the <laughs> ever-burning fire. Please. It'll your never be enough. Pit of neediness. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there a difference between actors who can make those jokes and those who just can't? Or can all actors make that joke? Oh, God, I hope all actors can make that joke or else you're profoundly unaware. Right. But, but I guess there are, there are more, like, self-serious actors. Um, but, yeah, not, most people are. I'm not, like, super unique in, in my ability to right, recognize I mean, my own um, uh, black hole. But, like, on some level— for thinking of a contemporary of yours, like say Daniel Day Lewis. Oh yes, da- Danny. Dan. Mm-hmm. Uh, to his friends. D man. On some level, even he must realize that well, even though he's cobbling shoes in Italy for a year to prepare for a role, that there is some ego and validation required because he is a human being, right? Or do you think that on a certain level, because you were alluding to actors who, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe feel that they are purely channeling uh, an yeah. artistic muse and not yes. Flow, I believe it's called, or I God. Thought that, I thought that was your nickname. Julie, Julie Cameron, I believe, the artist's way. Yeah. Um, now you're just showing off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like, yes, there are probably people who take it very seriously. And then then I start to go, oh, what's wrong with me? Am I am I not a real artist? <laughs> so, maybe, so it just like spins back on it. So you see how it spirals down? Yeah, we've only been talking for And it all minutes. comes back. <laughs> We've done a to poll. me. Let's keep it there. Mm-hmm. Um, we are here. Mm-hmm. Well, as I said, you've been here in L.A. for your annual summer sojourn for uh, almost three months now, I believe. Yes. Been trying to get you on a podcast ever since. I'm glad <laughs> we made it happen. Yes, I'm still not caught up on Game of Thrones. Therefore, it's probably good I wasn't. I know. Although Game we, of were, <laughs> we were very eager for you to be our guest. I mean, uh, I can talk about, you know, the fact that. She wasn't at the Red Wedding, and the baby wow. could still be alive. <laughs> but I'm way behind. Wow. I read all the books. So, Did you really? Yeah. Oh, you're a book person. Yeah, no, and I, I even that. read, like, the excerpts online of book. So you're six. not just a reader. You're a giant nerd. I, yeah, no, I was a huge fan. And then I didn't like the series at first because— That's the hottest take. I was so, like, this is not what I imagined, or that's not Why? who that was. Just because um, of the way they looked? Uh, looks, but also, like, all the little differences. And it's always that way. When you read a book, it's so yeah. much more nuanced than what you can get on That's screen. That's why I don't, I don't read. Yeah. Just, uh, 
Just the first television. three are amazing. Yeah. Four is pretty terrible. Oh. But you push through. And then five is okay. And then um, that's been it. And then that's been it. But, uh, yeah. I, and then I started watching the series again after I hadn't been reading the books. Mm-hmm. And I could appreciate the series because I, they weren't so in my imagination. These are some of the fire takes we missed. Oh, my gosh. In the live just, show. Just clip this and put this <laughs> on there. Because people are desperate to know what I think about Game After, of After, like, the epic battle of two weeks ago, it would have been great to have someone on. Yeah, no really, idea what you're talking really about. Really brought it back down to season two. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, let's all take a breath here. Chris is caught up now, I think. Chris could go on the Chris show. Chris Gear, yeah. your co-star. Thank you, just saved me with a segue yeah. on You're the Worst. Mm-hmm. And the reason we're talking. Yeah, people are, like, forwarding for that 15-second forward in I, order to be like, who I, the fuck is this? I, you can curse. <laughs> oh, good. You can curse now, yeah. I assume. Good, because I did. <laughs> I know. It's We're not going to edit that. I assume that uh, people are listening to this on two times speed to get to the good stuff anyway. Yeah, so. like, like you listen to Marin. No I, no, I just start Marin at ten minutes. Yeah, or no, I do minutes. the I do the little scroll thing. I really love Mark Marin, Me too. but I My don't favorite podcast. But, and I think he's a brilliant interview and a really interesting guy. But I just don't I don't want the daily check in with no, him. Me so either. I just skip the first. Do you, I, I'm never going on Marin now. You realize I just ruined any chance of ever being interviewed by Marin. I actually think poking the bear gets the bear's attention in oh. the case of Mark Marin. Great. I think he thinks Fuck about Fuck you, that. Mark Maron. Exactly. <laughs> My only interaction with him was when I gave a mediocre review to his IFC show, and he <gasps> tweeted about it. Oh, yeah. He said, he, he said he bet I felt good about this because I think I'm thinky. I think and I'm, like, I'm thinky. That's a I, good I line. I yeah. do think that. Um, quick Maron question for mm-hmm, you. Since yes. this is a podcast about yes. podcasts. I have this working theory mm-hmm. that since he has experienced – the kind of career validation he never thought he would through mm-hmm. Glow, which I think is a phenomenal show. And yeah. I think he's excellent in it. I agree. He has ch- he's changed dramatically on his podcast. He has softened. I think he's always been a softy uh-huh. under the crusty exterior. Yeah. But he has become much more patient and generous now that his axes are no longer being ground. Is that what you say yeah. about axes? That seems thinky. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's uh, – yeah, I think that's true, um, and I also think that uh, – or I, I'm curious about, like, the uh, persona of comedians versus, mm-hmm. like, who they really yeah. are because working in the comedy world and not being a comedian, I'm just constantly baffled by comedians or, or just confused by who I think they are, which is so silly because I'm an actor and people yeah. think that I'm somebody that I'm not – but I'm always very confused about the the sort of different. Well, that that's a lot. That's a that's a different line than between an actor and a character. Yeah, I think because it's their professional persona that evolves yeah. with them over yeah. time, as opposed to you playing a role once or for a few years and then. Yeah, but we want to buy. Like, I've been thinking a lot about this because I just recently decided like I'm not going to do comedy anymore. Not as an actor, but like as a person, I'm not. not going to do bits. Well, I'm just not particularly funny, and I get offered to do all these sort of funny podcast, funny uh, UCB things. Mm -hmm. And then I show up and just like feel profoundly ill-equipped and embarrassed by it. And then – and sort of just – like big cartoon eye, googly eyed <laughs> about the people who are so good at it around me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, maybe I don't need to pretend that I'm that. Maybe I don't need to pretend that I'm, uh, you know, uh, Kumail or who yeah. I just, I just did Doug Loves Movies and I, uh, mistakenly listened to a couple minutes of it, which I don't normally do. And I was like, oh, I hate me. <laughs> I think I'm, I I hate that girl. Like she, I'm just trying so hard to keep up with like this brilliant. But it's kind dude. of like like trying to run a race with a profession like an Olympian or something. Because yeah. we had that experience at the live show that you so <laughs> kindly neglected to join us for, really yes. politely, and not just that. <laughs> Aya is the sort of person if you're ever in a position to invite Aya to be a guest at your live after show for a television program she doesn't watch, could not be more polite. And then. Texting at length to help us find another guest. So it was very kind of you. But we did that show. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Chris and I were out there and Jason and Mallory. We're having a good time. We're in a mm-hmm. room full of people who I think want to hear us. Mm-hmm. We're enjoying the interacting banter. We get some laughs. Mm-hmm. And then we bring out Jason Manzukas and Andrea Savage. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like watching. Uh, it's like going from Division three college sports or high school sports. No, not even. I'm flattering myself. It's like yeah. watching middle school uh, yeah. B team 
and then going to the NBA. Yeah. Because they walk out and they have a gear. Yeah. Where they this is their realm. Yeah. And every choice they make is so sharp and like the right one. And yeah. Or like I did Ask Cat recently and every – I've done it twice now. And Zach Woods, like you just want to like – like take a scalpel and like peel back his skull and yeah. see what's in there. It's so brilliant and yeah. so amazing. And It'll Lauren be hard Lapkus. To reach and, his skull. I'm, yeah, he's very tall. You'd need a footstool. Everyone I know is in love with him, by the way. Hey, Zach Woods, if really? you're listening, you're not on social media, so I can't get in contact, really? but I have a lady for you if this you is want. This Jared <laughs> from Silicon Valley. Yes. And every, he's, a, he's a heartthrob. Because he's so smart and yeah. so funny and seems like – I don't know him very well. Yeah. But seems like just like a good guy. Wow. So uh, I have a feeling he's going to have a – I think he's recently single. And I think that's uh, – he's going to have a great time. <laughs> wow. We This is a newsy podcast. Yeah. <laughs> The, the beauty of this podcast is I, I keep yeah, trying to say – Yeah, what are we supposed say, to talk about? <laughs> I don't know. I think this is great. I keep trying to steer it back towards saying like you're the worst, mm -hmm. a show that I love. Yes, A show that you are on as a <laughs> professional actor yeah. is returning mm -hmm. for a fourth season on uh, Wednesday, September 6th. Six. That's very soon. We're going to mm – -hmm. we're recording this a few weeks ahead of that. We're going to put this up right before. Great. Um, we're excited to have the show back. Mm-hmm. We should probably talk about it a little, but okay. as we go on that journey together, mm -hmm. if you'd like to also just like blow up someone's OkCupid profile the way you just Great. did to Zach Woods. Oh, God, I know. Feel I'm sorry. free. If you want to take pot shots at other um, podcast hosts, mm -hmm. feel free. Great. Save space. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the phenomenon of making the show again. We were chatting about it before we hit record. Um, you are living the dream. You are bi-coastal. <laughs> yes. I have become... Maybe because I couldn't do it and mm -hmm. I gave up the <clears throat> better coast and mm -hmm. I live here now. I am both in awe of and deeply skeptical mm -hmm. of people who have managed to do this. Mm -hmm. But every year you come out here and you film the show mm -hmm. and you run racing back mm -hmm. to the to New York City's warm, dystopic embrace. Mm -hmm. How's that Well, you out? just have some cognitive dissonance because you've made a choice and now you feel like that, that must be the right choice. Or you have to feel I like that. I have to in order yeah. to survive. Yes. So I assume that the minute I left – the subways collapsed like some sort of wily e. coyote. Well, actually, invention. they might have. I mean, yeah. I've been hearing crazy things about this summer. I've yeah. been gone all summer, and apparently, the subway systems are a disaster. But so. that makes me feel so much better. Yeah, because I, I actually miss the subway. But now that it's apparently a hellscape, that's one eye patched Kurt Russell away from being uh, a science fiction film. I'm okay. I'm okay with my choice. Yeah. But how is this balance working for you? Uh, I think, I mean, I think it's great. I don't hate L.A. I like L.A. There's great parts about L.A. Um, I used to hate L.A. And then I woke up one day and was like, wow, L.A. doesn't really care that you hate it. So, like, <laughs> right. why are you bothering? Right. Um, drink, save your hate for things that, yes, you know, drink, deserve it. Drink this green juice. It's going to really quiet. affect, you know, Donald Trump really cares that I hate him. <laughs> um, no, but I, I don't, um... I, yeah. So I don't hate L.A. I really enjoy it. I have some great friends out here. One of my best friends moved out here to be on a show a couple of years ago. So I get to see her uh, during the summers, although she was doing a play. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's great, but it's not home. And I just feel like, you know, New York is home. And yeah. and I like um, – I'm, I like reading, and I read a lot on the subway. And I miss I like, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get so much reading done. I feel like I read so many more books because— And now that you'll be stuck at Hoyt Skammerhorn for 75 minutes between stations, <laughs> you could read, like, you could read whole books. I mean, you yeah. could read an entire— Exactly. Like, so, Game of Thrones compendium of, like, minor he, kings. He really all. needs to finish that six books. Um, yeah, so I, I, I feel like it works fine. Is it— a particular—it strikes me as kind of a unique and kind of, and in some ways appealing um, construct that you, you when you come out here, it is specifically. It's like it's not like summer camp, but it is a specific thing. You come out here in the summer, mm -hmm. you make this television show, and you are intensely involved in the making of this television show with this group of people that you've become mm -hmm. close with, and it's sort of the same pocket of time every year, and then you leave. Is, do, do you like the fact that your time here is so focused? So, which is to say, you're not going home to your quote-unquote regular life. You know what I mean? You are fully here with these people doing this thing. Does that 
help your performance or your experience making the show. Yeah, I like it. I've always liked summer camp, too. <laughs> like, when I was a kid, it was my favorite thing as well. I mean, I had a really cool summer camp. I went to Camp Winter Rainbow with Wavy Gravy as my camp counselor, and Taro Hart was my first boyfriend. So I had some good summer camp experiences. This is Northern California? Mm-hmm. We do, I think my friend went to Wavy Gravy's camp. Oh, yeah. He used to take his teeth out and warn us that if you didn't brush your teeth um, – you would you would lose all your teeth. And he said he used to brush his teeth with a Snickers bar. That doesn't seem legal in today's <laughs> child economy. I but. think it still exists. Someone, my friend who still lives in the Bay Area uh, brought me a Camp Winter Rainbow shirt recently. So I think it's still around. Camp Winter Rainbow. Win a rainbow. Oh, you win a winter rainbow. You win no a sense. rainbow. We slept in teepees. And um, this is like my nightmare. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix would like play on the fourth, and you'd get a pie in the face on your birthday. Not the real Jimi Hendrix; he no. was long no. dead. No, <laughs> <laughs> you've, you're painting it. You an would, idyllic. They would hippie. play. Yeah, um, and it was great. I learned how to stilt walk. Wow. Uh, I learned how to do Diablo, which is a sort of like string juggling. <laughs> it you're, sounds you're, ridiculous. Now you're just bragging. This no, just, I absolutely. This is I'm just bragging. cool. Um, but so I've always loved camp. So and I like I loved regional theater for the same reason. I loved going somewhere, right. focusing, creating that false intimacy <laughs> with a group of people. Yeah. Intense intimacy. Sometimes real intimacy, but often, you know, sort of like uh, short term intimacy and then, you know, going away. And so I always I always really love that. So I like coming out here and sort of doing this job with these people. And we see each other outside of this four months but um yeah i enjoy that and it feels like coming to la with a purpose is very helpful as an actor because you can come here and feel very out to sea uh in terms of the industry and trying to get work so i think that's true just for this as a city in general like I, i'm very grateful that i moved here with a purpose of type of work i wanted to do with a family already because i think it's just i don't know how one if you're if you were in your 20s or aimless I don't know how people would orient themselves here. Yeah. I, 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 the people watching in L.A. is amazing. And, yeah. and especially I, I have so much empathy for all these people who come out here and are trying to write scripts mm -hmm. and make movies and be in movies and, um, and are working so hard to create their web series or their shorts to sort of give themselves – like to claw their way mm -hmm. into the business. Um, and it's – uh, it's real tough. <laughs> but there's something I think, and I, I don't say this with any authority, but the things that appeal to you about making stuff in like a regional level and going mm -hmm. to camp, that is what making stuff in New York or trying to make stuff felt like to me because mm -hmm. you're just sort of all on top of each other and you're with a group of people who are generally in the same place in their lives mm -hmm. and you can – try and fail you know mm -hmm. you can if you wanted to be a comedian which we've established we didn't yeah. but you can there are open mics or there are mm -hmm. you know there's there's obviously a UCB here too but it it felt a little more intimate whereas here you're up what you're trying to break into is the monolith mm -hmm. and it feels less I mean this is an understatement of the century it does not feel very welcoming or approachable if you don't already have the in yeah. Although I feel like L.A. is more open to newcomers in a certain way. Like you're more likely to like show up and get like a huge job from nothing here. Mm -hmm. But you're more likely to build a career out of New York. Like if you are right. a stunningly beautiful 18 year old oh. boy or girl. Yeah. Go to L.A. Right. But like if you're remotely like not the standard of Margot Robbie, uh, you know. Gretchen Mall is the one I always use. Oh, OK. There but you go. From like no, no career to Vanity Fair cover. Yeah. And then well, well, there's a – you know Allie Larder was a, a hoax? Do you know who Allie Larder is? She, the, she was on the, Heroes. The, the Dorito was, commercial? I don't know. If she the Super Bowl commercial? Maybe. She's like a well, – she's a working actress. You yeah. should look this up. They did it. And I was talking about it the other day and someone was like, not really. And I was like, I think this is true. Allie Larder was put on the cover of a magazine as the new it girl with like a bunch of movies. She was – it was a hoax and she got a career out of it because people uh, – like studios started calling and being like, we want you in our movie. Let me be clear. Yeah. I was wrong and you were right. Yes. I did a quick quick Google mm -hmm. mid-interview. <laughs> In this entire Wikipedia page, Wikipedia, never wrong, by the way, mm -hmm. no mention of Doritos, Yeah, um, but a mention of hoax. Yeah. This is true. It's a pretty fascinating story. I mean, I've thought about it a lot, like the, the idea of that you can 
be famous Esquire. by being called famous. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of how our business works. And it's how everything – I mean it's how everything in this business works. It's all about sort of spin and, and – Perception. Yeah, perception. Um, how do you feel about that now? How do you feel about navigating those waters? Because you, as we know, you live in New York. Yeah. Have a life in New York. Um when you come out here, you come out here because you are the co-lead of a television show that people like. Um, what perspective does that give you into the industry now? Or what or, or what doors has it opened? Or what what perspective has it given you in terms of doors you would still like to walk through? You know, I feel like because I'm an adult, uh, uh, I don't navigate it much at all. Like there's just not a um, – you know, I'm not. I'm not going to be the next anything. I'm already ten years older than the next, so uh, I don't have to navigate it a lot. I, part of the reason I go back to New York is because I'm. Um, I find myself starting to value things that I don't actually value when I'm out here. Like I start to worry about stuff like that, um, or feel like, oh, I should, or I didn't get, or. You know, my friend has this or so-and-so is getting this or uh, – and I don't want to have that in my value system. Not that that's not – not that I'm not jealous or competitive or, or uh, insecure in New York, but it's easier to manage because it's not – you're not confronted with it every day. So I'm able mm -hmm. to focus on the things that I actually think are important and want to like fan the flames of as opposed to – I feel like it's yeah. like a little gaslight under – all those negative aspects of my personality out here that I don't really want to encourage. Just, it's hard not to be immersed in it. Totally. Here, but you can step away there. Yeah. And, um, and I'm constantly surprised by like the the perks or um, levels of fame. Like I don't even real – you don't even realize like, mm -hmm. oh, people just get given stuff. Like I remember the first time realizing that and you sort of hear about it but then seeing it and being like, oh, I could have – or invited to parties or put on magazines and mm -hmm. watching that happen to people like but it all feels very i i've been so outside of it for so long and watching it it doesn't feel real and then i'm mm -hmm. like oh wait they really do like just give an audi to someone anytime <laughs> they want it because they were on a show yeah someone by the way if anybody hi audi mr audi is listening hi audi <laughs> um, but uh yeah so i i'm like I, i'm always shocked by it and i don't think about any of it when um, – I'm not any of it, but I, but I mostly don't mm -hmm. have that thought in New York. For what it's worth, we, we did give you a free water that may or may not have been – That may have been opened earlier. <laughs> but let it be said, if you had, were you not a successful actress, we would not have given you totally. that water. But on the other hand, you're the worst who's also changed my life in a huge way. I mean I, I get offers to do things now. And that's really great and exciting because I hate auditioning. So it's great yeah. to like have someone be like, hey, will you come do this movie? And then I get to say yes or no. Hey, guys, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is on a mission to save home cooking because it's just too good to go away. They want to make cooking more fun, so they focus on the whole experience, not just the final plate. They like to think of themselves as a farm-to-box company because they want everyone to have access to fresh ingredients that inspire great meals, but they don't stop there. They're also a couch-to-kitchen company because the best way to kick those 5 p.m. excuses is by feeling unstoppable in the kitchen. They do even more than that. They are proud to be a fork to feel good company because when you cook and eat delicious, healthy meals, you'll want to keep doing it again and again. If they could do the dishes for you, they would, but the number one priority is to get you cooking. HelloFresh offers customers a classic box, a veggie box, and a family box. Customers can order three to five different meals per week designed for two to four people, and there are new recipes created every week. The recipes will make you feel unstoppable, and your taste buds will thank you. In six easy-to-master steps, they'll get you chopping, zesting, and cooking like a natural because most of their recipes take just 30 minutes and require minimal equipment. They are constantly experimenting in the kitchen, let fresh, natural ingredients shine, and they offer ever-changing menus, classic ingredients put into a new light, and easy-to-follow recipes to help you avoid that food coma and feel good inside and out. 
HelloFresh is the meal kit delivery service that makes cooking more fun so you can focus on the whole experience, not just the final plate. Each week, HelloFresh creates delicious new recipes with step-by-step instructions designed to take around 30 minutes for everyone, from novices to your little Ina Gartens at home. HelloFresh sources the freshest ingredients measured to the exact quantities so that there is no food waste. HelloFresh employs two full-time registered dietitians on staff to review each recipe and ensure that it is nutritionally balanced. They deliver food to your doorstep in a recyclable insulated box for free, and they are offering light fall meals, and they have just introduced breakfast options. I love using HelloFresh. It's just taken my kitchen to a new level. Usually I'm just in there, I'm grazing on chips, you know, I have a, like, I'm just like, oh, what am I going to eat? Maybe I'll just, like, make a grilled cheese tonight. Maybe I'll make some, like, instant mac and cheese. But with the fresh ingredients and the easy-to-follow instructions, I feel like I'm just like Anthony Bourdain in there. Like, I'm unstoppable. You can't stop me when I'm on HelloFresh. For $30 off your first week of deliveries, visit HelloFresh.com and enter WATCH30. That's WATCH30 when you just subscribe. Now for more of Andy's interview with Aya Cash. What's the vibe, um, going back to that summer camp idea, what is the vibe of this crew now, this ragtag crew of You're the Worst? It's, you, you, this is the fourth season. I mean, that's, uh, that's a respectable number of seasons for any show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also has its own challenges both in front of and just around the cameras because you're going back into this world. You're working with these people again. You're playing this character again. And to, you know, you, you, you're a theater actress. Um, theater girl. <laughs> uh, I should have used the Audi voice for that. You know, the, the 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 challenge in front of that is do you play one thing and you, you, you get to sort of hone, chip away at it, and then you walk away. You're mm-hmm. growing someone yeah. year to year. Um, I mean, in terms of the environment, I'd say this year is one of the best, actually. We had a lot of our crew members back that we were missing last year. Like props is some of my favorite people on set, and they weren't around last year, and they were back. Because you, you had no props? Or no, because... we had other prop p- people. Because you, you did film the, in a different window the people, last year. Yeah, I mean, because we are a summer shoot, um, unfortunately, we, we end up going into network seasons, and, and people mm. need nine-month jobs, not three-month jobs, mm-hmm. so they have to leave. So, like, our props department has switched um, this block, which is sad because those people, like – you know, on sets, you're you're there anywhere from 12 to 17 hours a day, and they're like your friends and family. And uh, and it's also really nice to have friends on set who are not actors too, because you want to like you sometimes you you want to break away from that for a little while. Also, as discussed previously, actors are just <laughs> bottomless black holes of need, <laughs> yes. and you need to. <laughs> draw a line somewhere. Sure. Right. Um, but so we had a lot of great crew members back, and that was really fun. Our camera department is amazing this year. It's just been a really great season. And I think um, I really love the scripts this year. I mean, I always like the scripts, but I just think this year is really great. And so everyone seems like they're in a really great space. I think it helps none of us. Um, none of us started famous, and none of us got the kind of fame that is disruptive. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're all still really happy to have a job and really grateful for all of that. And um, I think that really helps morale. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when that, when that pit is fed too much. (laughs) Overfed. (laughs) Yeah. Overfed. Which is usually not a problem in LA. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I was just, (laughs) never mind. Um, I ate a bag of hollow last night. I was like, I'm such a bad actress. Um, <laughs> but a very good Jew. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it, we have a we have a really lovely time of it. And then in terms of developing character, I just feel. I mean, I feel so gross sometimes talking about the show because one, it can feel a little self congratulatory because you're talking about your show, and secondly, uh, because it sounds like such bullshit. But I just really feel so hashtag blessed that I get to do this because they get they put like I'm doing crack this year. I'm doing like I, I, I was going to talk about that. I yeah. go every direction. They just take me to all these different places, so I don't get bored of this person. Like it's not like. Oh, I wish I could play someone else. I get to play like 90 different types of Gretchen and that's so exciting because I do think that as people we are I'm I mean I just know 
myself. I'm so different in every situation. Like even different friendships have different mm -hmm. dynamics. Before I met my husband, I was the talker in all my relationships who wanted to like process and talk. And like my husband is so much more of a talker. I'm the one who's like the withholding. <laughs> like can't we just sweep this under the rug? You know, you, you have different <laughs> sides of yourself that come out. And I love that Gretchen just gets to do all of that. I, I think um, – and, and fans of the show over all seasons will agree with me. One of the most exciting things about it is um, the show as a multi-headed construct and Stephen Falk as, as the, the creator and showrunner's uh, personal ability to do this. But the show never stops pushing forward, paints itself in the corners, then breaks through the wall to keep to keep going. Um, to to watch the pilot of You're the Worst, which is still just note perfect, is also to think, well, there's no way this is a series. You know, this is just a – this is very funny and clever observed bit, but you can't make a show about this. Mm -hmm. And then you have the first season, which is also, in my opinion, close to perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't keep going because what can – there's a reason why rom-coms, such mm -hmm. as they are, are 90 minutes. Yeah. Because then you don't have to answer the unfortunate questions. You don't have to keep going, well, what happens next? Yeah. Um, is happiness boring or whatever? But – the show, and I think when I've spoken to Steven, he's credited this a little bit to his um, tutelage under Genji Cohen, mm -hmm. but always there's always more story. Mm -hmm. You just have to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And it's very exciting and rewarding to see it in season four. And I've only seen the premiere. Mm -hmm. It's an hour-long premiere on Wednesday, September 6th on FXX. Good job. You're much better at that. Than I am. Um, the show left us in a surprising place last year, but once again, like, a, well, how do you come back from this? Mm -hmm. What else is their place? Yeah. Um, apparently the, what is their place involves, um, elder care and I won't spoil too much and, um, the ingestion of crack cocaine mm -hmm. and, uh, it's what I needed for the show. No, right. it, but it, but it's, but it's, it's thrilling yeah. it, to be along for that ride. And I can only imagine what it's like on, on your side of it to continually have more to play with. There is no stalling out. There is no, very little repetition. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I wonder, I'm curious if you... Like having written on Legion mm -hmm. and being, which by the way, I think we reference it in the show yes. because Colin kept saying Legion, and I kept being like, "It's <laughs> Legion." <laughs> um, yeah, I think Legion we have a, a I think show. we have a Legion joke in the show. That's so nice. Um, I, I think I, I felt like which Stephen, I loved, by the way. I mean, I've told you, uh, which I appreciate. <laughs> but Stephen, uh, there was the whole thing last year with like the prestige drama that nobody mm -hmm. watched. That mm -hmm. was. Clearly, like inspired by rectify, rectify but it was, what? It was abilify or yeah, something. something. <laughs> it, 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 no, that, I think that's a made up. That's a real drug. I think. Yeah, that's a real thing. Um, let's take some and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, he said that I felt I felt seen. Yeah, know, as one of Rectify's seven fans. Yeah. Um, I, but wait, what was the question? As uh, just like after writing yeah. on Legion, uh, yeah, Legion. does Legion. it make you Legion <laughs> after after getting a Legion? Um, does it make you think differently about watching TV? I mean, obviously, you were in criticism for mm -hmm. so long. Obviously, you know about structure. You know about – but it does it change your perspective of – A little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it reinforced what I believed, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, television is at its core, and you can either run away from this or run towards it, is a is a plot in, is a plot eating machine. Mm -hmm. And you just have to – much like uh, validation towards actors mm -hmm. and writers, by the yes. way. <laughs> you have to keep shoveling story. Uh -huh. um, and you can run towards it or run away from it. But either way, you have to come up with something. Yeah. And that in order to, to, to make that seem entertaining or plausible or unique, you have to do with all the – the important work is done with the characters and the emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but that on a very deep level, because there's just so much story episodes to make, um, you, you, you do your best – you, you try to make the best out of what can be an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. um, the best idea isn't always the right idea, or it may not work, but you you just – you break your brains and then you come up with something and you commit to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even – you know, even I was there. I don't know if that always worked with Legion. Yeah. But um, you have to – you you can't sit back and rest, you know. And I think that Stephen – the the mindset that Stephen has mm -hmm. for the show is crucial. Um yeah. Both for audiences, but also for um, people making it, mm -hmm. you know, actors and writers. Do you think audiences forgive missteps? Because I feel like what is – the shows that I'm interested in sometimes, like, have bad mm -hmm. moments or, you know, things that don't work or plot points mm -hmm. that sort of fail. I mean, 
let's not even talk about season two of Friday Night Lights. But <laughs> we've, all, we've all agreed <laughs> yes. to forget about that. Yes. Um, but I, I wonder if people forgive and if, if audiences in general are more excited to just see new stuff. Or, but then you look at network television and yeah. there's sort of a standard that people seem – people want to see the same thing a lot Pe- because it feels familiar or it – People want comfort out of television even though yeah. we're in a prestige era. It's yeah. – even though the, the content has changed, we still sit on our couches and we want to be fed yeah. in a calming way. Yeah. Um, I think there's two answers to that. I, I think um, one is, and Chris and I just spoke about this when we were talking about Game of Thrones, if you give people the character stuff and the emotional stuff they want, you can yada yada the details. Nobody yeah. really cares how they picked that lock or yeah. solved that crime. Nobody yeah. cares. They want to know the character Reddit stuff. Reddit cares. <laughs> well, Reddit cares, but that's not a fun way to engage with yeah. anything. But I, But your question, I think, is a really good one because our, people talk about how much audiences have advanced along with the medium. Are people willing to understand on a deep level TV is an imperfect medium? It has to be. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there were things um, that I didn't pr- remind myself about in preparation for this interview, and I apologize. No, but I there were things in season three of You're the Worst that I was like, I'm not sure mm-hmm. during the season. Yeah. But because I'm a fan of the people making it, mm-hmm. it can be to me, and maybe this is I'm too in it, mm-hmm. but it's engaging to watch people – I don't want to say mess up, but make choices I wouldn't make and then mm-hmm. get out of them mm-hmm. or not. You know, yeah. like it's kind of like watching a high wire act when you're thinking mm-hmm. about it on a meta level or on a creative level. Mm-hmm. Um, th- you can't make – how many episodes of You're the Worst have you made? Uh, oh, gosh. I think 36 uh, and then this season we're on episode 10, so 46. For- they can't be 46. No one can make 46 perfect episodes of anything. Yeah. You can't make 20 perfect episodes, yeah. right? But that's for me. That's kind of exciting. I yeah. don't know if it feels that way when you're when you're making it. Yeah. No, I feel it too. I mean, I, I also, you know, look, I can, I can be bad. Heather can be bad. Chris can be bad. Des can be bad. Luckily, we have editing. You know, that's the the joy of television mm-hmm. is that they prevent you from being bad. Like as actors, we can all be bad as well, or make the wrong choice, or and hopefully you have a good director who catches it, or right. you know that stuff. Um, but I feel like we're less forgiving in uh, in television and movie because we're like, no, 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 this is the finished product and the fin- finished product should taste a certain way, should yes. smell a certain way, should be – you know what I mean? It should be uniform. Yeah. Like at a restaurant, you want the dish to be the same every yeah. time. I think movies, there's always been an expectation of perfection. Mm-hmm. Television, less so. But the lines are blurring now that we have – prestige TV. And but especially when you only have 13 episodes, right? So the 26, I feel like you can kind of go yeah, off the rails a, a little bit. Um, but Make a character a murderer for no reason. And <laughs> yeah. Then retcon it. Yeah. You can do that. Um, and then never reference it. In the never. Season Which I respect. <laughs> yeah, totally. That was the right choice. <laughs> Great. You know, and you know, in the writer's room, they had a spirited debate about that. Like, we, yeah. we owe it to the people to, like, answer for it. Move on. Yeah. Just just like someone who really murdered someone in yeah. real life. You just try and move on. I also really like unanswered questions. Like yes. I love Louis C.K. having, you know, the, his two w- little white girl children with their black mother yeah. and that we don't have to talk about it because you don't talk about shit like that. Uh, you know what I mean? And like, does, it, does this matter to what we're watching? Yeah. Is this what we're watching? I've been really debating like – so colorblind casting, this is such a pivot, but I'm Do thinking because I'm making – I'm hitting the microphone. I'm making a movie and – We should talk about this. This is exciting. Yeah. I hope it's exciting. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm thinking about colorblind casting on stage versus on film and mm-hmm. why we expect mm-hmm. reality to look a certain way mm-hmm. on film that we do not have that requirement on stage, especially with like Shakespeare, mm-hmm. right? You can – you're allowed to – colorblind cast Shakespeare. You can have somebody in the same family be a completely different race. Or in a hip-hop musical about the founding fathers. Totally. Uh, Hypothetically. I just saw it again. Did you see it here? (laughs) I did. It was great. Um, Yeah, and I was like, why don't, why aren't we doing that on film? Like, why, why is that a requirement? And, And will audiences go with that? I mean, I think people, what I've learned from Hollywood is there's a lot of fear around what are, what are because there's a, a heightened awareness about responsibility in this way that people are worried about what they're saying to the point of not going to that place. Why, why even ask the question? Have the question be asked? We're yeah. afraid of that response, that yeah. conversation, or right. like no, but then we have to address it. But otherwise, it's 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 it's, it's yeah. a sin of omission. 
Yeah. And I and I'm not a hundred percent I'm not clear about the answer. And I'm not clear yeah. that like colorblind casting is the way to go and that, you know, it shouldn't matter if people are in the same family who look completely different and if we have to address it in that way. I, I'm not saying that that's the right way. I'm just so curious why being on camera we don't I, see that. I except in I can't think of another example besides No, I think it's a great point. And I think that to to the the potential um uh, counterpoint against this is, you know, when you have a sit- like a network sitcom about like young friends, not friends, but because yeah. that was very white, but <laughs> recent versions attempting to do that where mm-hmm. there's like six friends and five of them are white and one of them isn't. Mm-hmm. And the one who isn't, that is never mentioned. It's yeah. never examined, never explored. That's yeah. not who that person is. And it's sort of like, but look how, look, look at this utopia we're presenting. But yeah. It seems yeah. a sin of omission. But to your question, why on film? I'm very interested in that. And there's something, I think it goes to that idea of intimacy and how we interact. We we watch a television show. It's ours. They're mm-hmm. our friends, our family, where they're in our home. Um, and so we want to know everything. We feel like that information is owed to us mm-hmm. in a way. But I think the flip side of that is the way that you mentioned like Reddit and, and mm-hmm. Twitter have changed television viewing. Mm-hmm. We're all kind of detectives watching shows now mm-hmm. as if as if filmed entertainment are puzzles to be solved. Mm-hmm. There's one, one theory that's right that's going to... F- Mm-hmm. line all the pieces together. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's a terrible way to engage with art in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, it was fun. I loved watching Lost. Mm-hmm. Like, I loved yeah. daydreaming about the stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like, it has to be something more than that or else it's Westworld. It's yeah. just a, a, pu- a trick. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not see that coming, that twist coming, by the way. People were talking about it and the, I was like, no. We shouldn't spoil it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that yeah, that one. Yeah. I know what you mean. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I wish things people. I wish people. I wish TV viewers were more comfortable just letting mm-hmm. them, as the leftovers theme music said, mm-hmm. letting the mystery be. Yeah. And people aren't comfortable with ambiguity or uncertainty in their lives, and so I think they're not comfortable with it in their television. Is it just where we think imagination should be? Like imagination is for books and for theater. Like that we're more willing to like create. Okay, we're going to a black mm-hmm. box space, mm-hmm. and like not everything is exactly right. And like I'm very aware that I'm sitting in an audience yes. with people, so I'm allowed to use my imagination. Versus like, no, this is what's being shown to me, so it must reflect reality. And in that some there's way. an answer. Yeah. Like. Done. Yeah. No, that I know who did who did yeah. that. You can look anywhere on stage. You're not forced to look at the one person who's talking. You could look off to the right at the spear carrier and see them yawn and yeah. have that moment. Or the person sitting next to you and see them yawn. Yeah, exactly. Depending person. on the play. Yeah, I don't know. I... So what is so tell tell us what a gross <laughs> host thing to say. Tell us about your film project. What you are making a movie. Yeah, I'm develop. I've been developing a script that's based on my mother's book, a book called Little Beauties, mm-hmm. um, that was published more than ten years ago. I Your mother's think. name is Kim Adonizio. Kim Adonizio, A D D O N I Z I O. Very smart. Someone was like. I went on Conan and said her name, and it said someone was like, "Great, you said your mom's name, Kim." <laughs> was like nerves. Can't Google that. So I've been developing that. It's about a woman in her 30s who is recently separated and um, struggling with fairly severe OCD and a pregnant young teenager who uh, they sort of run into each other and, you know, change and grow, all that good stuff. But um, – And there's a script, this is a script that you did? No, um, I did not write it. Uh, the writer is Terrell Seltzer. She wrote One Fine Day. Mm-hmm. She actually initially – she wrote this script. She's friends with my – don't think about this too hard. My best friend's mother mm-hmm. is her best friend. Oh, so you're related. So, yeah. <laughs> so she had gotten the book from my best friend's mother and then uh, wrote a screenplay and I think Fox Searchlight bought it. Reese Witherspoon developed it. It was mm-hmm. like – this was 10 years ago. Um, and then it all fell apart. And then she came to me a couple years ago and said, what if we do the original script, not the one with all the changes mm-hmm. that Reese did uh, with you? And I said, sure, but I want to I want to redevelop it as a very small indie because um, it was not. It was obviously yeah. a much bigger budget. Um, and so we've been developing it for two years and, and I am now directing it as well. Which is very exciting. Is exciting as a word. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to sort of to learn everything I can about filmmaking, and I'm uh, possibly going to shadow one of the directors on You're the Worst, who has also made an indie film. 
and um, uh, yeah, just cram my brain full of knowledge. But I said, I said, I have lots of opinions and not a lot of technical skill. And she said to me, she said, that's all you need. Yeah, that's and men do it all the time. Are for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for real though, that's true. <laughs> men are like, I'm going to direct a movie. <laughs> or I'm going to be president of the United <laughs> yeah, States. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No big deal. <laughs> Why can't I? <laughs> are you, what, what is your timeline or time frame? I'm hoping to shoot. We don't have the money yet. I haven't even pitched yet. Um, I'm putting together, you know, lookbook stuff. And, and we just finished what I think is a really strong draft. So we'll go out to money. And I would hope to shoot it March next year. And the DP of You're the Worst has already said he'll do it. Um, so exciting. I have some crew think, members in place and some actors. Will that you I star as well? Can't say. Yeah. That's, that seems... That yeah. seems exciting, but also that seems tricky. Yeah, I'll have someone on set sort of as an acting coach to make mm -hmm. sure that we're getting what we need that way so that I can set up shots and, and do that. I experimented on a movie last year getting sent some dailies just to see, mm -hmm. okay, can I watch myself and not be a pit of craziness? <laughs> um, and I could, uh, So, which is was surprising to me because I don't like watching myself, but there was something about the act of being – Sort of, okay, I'm not looking at this as me as an actor. I'm mm -hmm. looking at this in – I'm wearing a different hat, um, a trilby. <laughs> but uh, – I fetching. Yes. Uh, so I was excited to learn that I can separate in that way. Is it the dream of every actor to deliver a line and then say, cut, that's lunch? <laughs> you know, just like basically do – <laughs> not stop talking, just dominate the entire – It's not – it's never no. been my dream. This is uh, – my this happened because I started to feel very strongly about how this movie should be made. And um, I realized that I would probably be pretty devastated if anyone else did it because I have very – I mean, I can see the opening in my head. I can mm -hmm. see – and I would be very upset to have that taken away. Um, I don't know if I want to be a director in real life. I also am a – a, a lady who is an adult we've established you so said it twice yeah that is that but that is that is something real in this business mm -hmm. whether or not that's changing whether or not that's something to be afraid of because i don't want to live my life wa that way but it is helpful i think to start to branch out in in other ways in this business because being an actor is already such a passive role and a pick me pick me mm -hmm. kind of thing and it's not really as you get older, what it's not what suits me either, just in general. Temperament. Yeah. So I would like to be more involved. Well, I think that's yeah. smart to think about it on both sides, that it, 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 it's an incredible opportunity and a different path could open up. But also what you're saying echoes something that I heard once that was great advice when I had to, to write a book. I was like, I can't write books. And they said, mm -hmm. well, no one's asking you to write books. Mm -hmm. They're just asking you to write this one yeah. that you know about. Mm -hmm. You're just work. You're not becoming a great director or a director of, of films. You want mm -hmm. you can envision this film and then take it yeah. from there. Um, quickly, because you've given us a lot of your time and your thoughts about being an adult <laughs> lady, which is usually the subject of this podcast, by the great. way. But you have a perspective it's on it called, that I lack. That's the the. <laughs> The, what is it called? I didn't mention I the new name. It. It's Andy yeah. Greenwald is an adult lady. Yeah, great. I it's, like it. Yeah. I feel it. We can we can sort of kick around <laughs> the name and branding. Um, I wanted to ask you about other things on your um, mm -hmm. IMDb page oh, that you've okay. worked on um, mm -hmm. that have yet to come out. Uh -huh. But you have three film projects that are listed as in existence, uh -huh. all of which are great names, uh -huh. better than Andy Greenwald is an uh -huh. adult lady. Um, one is called Fucking People. Uh-huh. Great name. <laughs> yeah. Tough to see on a marquee in every market. Uh-huh. But good. Uh-huh. Tell me about this. Uh, that's a movie I shot in Austin last year with Josh Radner, Noel Wells, uh, Carly Chaikin, uh, Samir Wiley. I mean, the cast is cast. insane. Fortune Feimster. Um, yeah. Um, my dog is in the movie. Uh, well, now. <laughs> has a credit. Really? In the credits. Did, did it Lucy go to your, Cash. Did, they, they did it go to her head? Did it? I mean, she doesn't know yet. So okay. once she does, she probably will be like, I'll only eat, you know, raw chicken hearts. But, um, uh, yeah, it's great. It's a first-time writer-director named Teresa Bennett who is just wonderful and has become a great friend. Our dogs just had a doggy play date, oh. and it's a really fun movie. But I don't I, – I don't uh, – I don't know when that's going to be available. you go off and you have these summer camp experiences and totally. then other people have to make – 
other people are in charge of what yeah, happens then they, with it. They have to finish the movie they and then they stuff. have to post the movie and then they have to, you know, they do all of it. And Game Over Man is a like a, the Workaholics guys yeah. made this movie? Yeah. Um, that is a blast. It's like, you know, like Die Hard except they're the heroes. Um, really fun. Spoiler alert. I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but they probably will never hear this. Um, I got to sing It Wasn't Me with Shaggy at four in the morning on the top of a roof. With that actual Shaggy? With actual Shaggy. Why didn't you lead with that? Like that is – I know. I, I'm i just going to – I'm real – Really gonna get myself in trouble here. Please, you know that part when he's like, I don't know, no, 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 and we don't know the words. Yeah, he kind of did that too at one point. <laughs> I was like, Do you not know the words either? Not even Shaggy knows the words. <laughs> um, but that was pretty. That was a big highlight of that film. And that's a Netflix thing. That's a Netflix. That'll come out next year. I think they announced it's somewhere next spring. And finally, back to you're the worst. Wait, f- we have to say one. Because it's about to premiere. Oh, I didn't say one that was coming. Oh, tell me. Mary Goes Round is premiering at... um, It uh, was here, too. I didn't just miss it. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, Well, I just... I'm so proud of this movie. It's premiering at Toronto Film Festival. Nice. um, On September 9th. Um, Also, a brand new uh, writer, director, woman named uh, Mary... Molly McGlynn. I'm Mary. (laughs) She's Molly. Yeah. Um, And that's going to be at Toronto, which is amazing. I mean, they shot it for nothing. I think total shooting budget was like 110 Canadian. Um, And it's a beautiful movie with an incredible cinematographer named Nick Haight. It's his first movie. And I was like, you're a mad genius. Everyone involved was incredible. I feel like it's both exciting and risky because when when you take these movies with first time people, you're taking a leap of faith on on the people. And that could Mm -hmm. be thrilling and exciting, but it could go sideways. Yeah, I mean, what I've learned from doing a lot of these recently is that, you know, the meeting means a lot, right? So, like, sit down, have a real conversation with someone and see if you like each other. And usually that's a good indication of whether or not you're going to have a good time on the movie. Yeah. Um, And, you know, it's really hard to make indie film and it's hard to get distribution and you don't get paid any money and you're away from home. So I'm now – taking a little break from stuff and let, I used to say yes to everything because I was so excited you to work. You are an improv comic. Yeah. Yes and. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm I'm being – like I really want to go home. So there's some movies in L.A. that um, I was offered and I was like I, I, I would rather be at home and, and spending time reminding my husband that we're married. <laughs> <laughs> You're the worst season four, September 6th. Um, you do smoke crack. That's that is a thrilling Gretchen plot smokes point. Crack. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, am I not supposed to talk about the other part? The <laughs> no. character of Gretchen smokes. I've crack. done a lot of work on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm under the deep research method actor. Um, tell me about the season without telling us anything about the season, because one <laughs> okay. of the joys of the show is we don't know. We, you know, I yeah. don't think anyone going into the second season could have would have guessed or predicted mm-hmm. Gretchen's depression arc, which was so beautifully handled and beautifully played by you. Um, Des's, uh, Edgar's, uh, Des is the actor, Edgar's the character, um, PTSD storyline last year, um, and the way it was woven in and behind the scenes. I mean, this is, these are the risks that the show takes that really elevate it. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't want to know what's been done this year, mm-hmm. but the season, the show left us in a precarious place with our beloved core couple. Um, we've alluded to maybe some harder time, dark mm-hmm. times. What, how would you characterize the tenor of the season? I think, I mean, I'd say it, gets pretty weird i think things go weird like there's a there's a moment that like references a horror film like it's a really strange like there's some weird stuff um it's almost as if like you know all the stuff you feel when you're in a breakup it's like but it's it's out it's in action as opposed to feeling like yeah there's just some crazy stuff um, and, and these are colors the show has, the show has not really played with because the characters were fighting or fighting against, but fighting towards each other. And yeah. now we're in a different place. Yeah, and we're very separate this season. I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that I've worked with Chris maybe five days this whole season so far. That's good because he has that ratty beard thing going on. Maybe yeah. you don't want to be around like it. The beard. Do you really? I do. I think it's cute. Wow. I like facial hair. Hmm. I guess I'm just a typical hipster. Um, <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, so we spend a lot. Of, it's really sad, actually, because we, we keep seeing each other socially and being like, how's it going yeah. for you? And we really love working together. So that's been strange. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of – there's some other combos. And uh, there's a very cool episode with Sasha Mamet who – um, oh, yeah. that'll happen mid season. That's, that's a re I'm so excited to see it, but that's, I was saying before we, before we got on mic, mm. um, that we shot a 15 page day one night with her and she's a rock star. So, um, there's just some really fun, interesting stuff, but we're very separate this year. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing it, yeah. um, beginning September 6th, 10 o'clock, 10 PM on FXX yes. or on your FX now Apps? I don't know. I don't work for them. I don't I? know. Actually, I did work for them. I do work for them. You did work, <laughs> I did for, them. work for them. But uh, you know, not 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 presently. Um, <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Me too. Thank you for coming by. We mentioned the movies, got the TV show, and now everybody knows that if you are stuck in a tunnel under the East River in a stifling subway car, and you look across and you see someone reading a giant book who looks like the star of You're the Worst, guess what? It is. But probably. Don't, bo- don't yeah, bother. Just put your hand right in my face. That's my favorite. <laughs> Perfect. Now everyone knows how to handle it. Thanks, Aya. Thank you.